Hello and welcome to Podiatry Practice Mastery. My name is Don Pelto and I have Nancy Erickson here. And uh, Nancy, we're going to be talking a little bit to you about your passion with helping people getting their ideas on in books. So welcome. Great. Great. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so, so Nancy, I, I can see from behind you, look at all those books. Um, so tell me a yeah, little bit. Yeah, and that's bit. just one wall. So. Wow. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your backstory, kind of how you got into helping people write books. Um, is your interest in writing? Is it marketing? Kind of what's, what's your interest? Well, I, I'm passionate about books, but I got into this kind of sideways. My actual original career was in high tech. I was a systems engineer for IBM, and then I worked for Oracle Corporation. And I mean, serious high tech jobs, you know, and so on sales teams selling to Fortune 100 companies and um, making a lot of money. I mean, that's a good income, but I really didn't like it at all. It was just a lot of pressure, just ridiculous quotas and all sorts of things. But like most people, I had a pivotal moment in my life. And that was when my father was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor. Wow. And so we knew that he would only live about seven months and it was pretty textbook. So during that time, I quit my job. I quit doing everything that I had been doing. And I went to back and forth to Florida where my parents were living um, to be with them, you know, to help manage things um, until he passed away. And then I came home and I was like, okay, <laughs> now what am I going to do? You know, I quit my job. You know, I had my kids really young and my kids were already out of college at that point. And so I thought, you know, I always loved to write. I really loved that. I had things published when I was younger. I thought I'm just going to learn more about the craft of writing. So I went back to school and got a master's degree, in, a master's of fine arts in writing and was then asked to join the faculty at the university to teach writing. So at the same time that I joined the faculty to teach, I also started um, Stonebrook Publishing, which is a nonfiction publishing house. And so, um, and that was about 14 years ago. And so um, it was pretty cool, the things that happened. Of course, I enjoyed teaching, but in the publishing side, I had a couple of really, what I considered to be big hits right off. And the first was we published a book by a Holocaust survivor who had gone to school with Anne Frank. And so the book was amazing. And we ended up doing the book release at their school in Amsterdam. And so it was so amazing. And then um, I got a call from another set of authors who were looking to be published and we published their book as well. And we got back cover endorsements for that book from two pretty high profile people, Sir Paul McCartney and Cindy Crawford. And so I thought, oh my gosh, I, I must know what I'm doing. You know, this is going really well. And this is really fun. But at the same time, we were getting manuscripts from writers who had a seed of what we were looking for. And our material, all of our material is intended to do one of three things, either change lives, save lives, or transform society. And so it would have a seed of that in there, but it was so poorly written that we couldn't do anything with it. We couldn't edit our way out of it. So I had, a, a, I guess it was kind of a spiritual God moment you know, when I was in my office one day and I all of a sudden just felt this rush of, I heard, felt something that just said, stop, you know, take a step back and teach people how to write creative nonfiction, high impact nonfiction books. And so it was kind of cool because I could combine my knowledge from teaching at the university with publishing. So what I did is I did take a step back and I wrote a step-by-step -step process that takes authors to, from their original idea. All you have to have is an idea to get started all the way through to the end where their book is published and distributed worldwide on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, you know, libraries, et cetera. So um, it was sideways, you know, it all came from that pivotal moment when, uh, you know, we had the, the issue with my dad. Um, and since then, you know, we published, you know, hundreds of books and 
you know, have award-winning, it's, a, we're an award-winning publishing house. So I'm really proud of it, but I'm mostly proud of the authors that we work with because what they are is they're, they're normally, they're professionals, they're doctors, attorneys, business leaders, and, you know, nobody quits their job to write a book. I hope not anyway. And they're using their book material uh, to augment their business practice. And um, that, that might be what would appeal to podiatrists that, that are in your circle. I, that, what a wonderful you know, story, Nancy, of, of kind of, and I think just what you did there is what I appreciate about good written books. And it's that format of kind of telling the background story. And like even as a podiatrist, you know, we can talk about plantar fasciitis, everything else, but what they really like, what my patients really like is my background story, kind of how I got into it, what's the story behind it, why my passion is what I, what area of podiatry I'm passionate about, uh, and, and why that is, because they, they like the emotions, they like the stories. That's so true. Mm -hmm. That is exactly true. And that, you know, it's interesting, because when I'm working with professional people, particularly doctors, they tend to want to give the, their clinical front, you know, not their personal story. But and I think that used to work in maybe in the 90s, you know, early 2000s. It doesn't work anymore. People are craving connection, whether it's with their, their doctor or their, you know, anybody that it's certainly if they're reading a book, they want to know the person behind the book. And so we spend a lot of time crafting your personal story so that you ingratiate yourself with your readers and you know you can't I mean you can't even do this in teaching anymore nobody stands at the front of the room and tells you what to do or what you should do that big should word you know is kind of <laughs> out of vogue right now but you invite people to come along with you to learn what you've learned and particularly when you're in a field of medicine there are a lot of things that people need to, know. your feet are really important. And when, when, when your feet start hurting, you're in trouble, you know, it affects yeah. everything in your life. And there's so many things that are associated with good foot care that we don't think about because we just cover them up and go walk somewhere. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, but when you, in, you, you have to, you know, invite the readers into your world a little bit so that they can learn from you. Otherwise, they don't trust you. Yeah, you, you know, I think what, what you're saying, you know, it seems like this can be used for book writing, but let's just kind of look, pull back a little bit. Like people are doing uh, um, newsletters, people are doing yeah. uh, blog posts, people are doing like this whole idea of like telling a little get to know me story or sharing get to know me pictures, and then maybe going into something about ingrown toenails. But what people really like is the story portion. That's what I've, I've read some different books about storytelling and things. And, and I love listening to stories and people and you sharing your stories. So how do people, do you have any good tips of um, let's, let's say people want, let's say they're not ready, Nancy, to, to use you. Let's say they want to do it on their own. What are some tips of gathering stories, organizing, well, ideas, writing, things like that? A great question. Cause stories are the most important thing. The only reason people are going to remember anything is through start storytelling. And so, like you said before, you have to engage the emotions and stuff. So I have a little formula I have, if I could share with you about how to tell your own story, okay? And I did this when I told you what happened with me. And the formula is three-part. It's like what it used to be like. Remember, I told you I worked for Oracle and for IBM and I made a lot of money, but I wasn't happy, okay? The what happened part is that pivotal moment. My dad was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor and I quit my job and went to help my folks. And then kind of the what it's, but there's many parts to the what happened, right? So your pivotal moment isn't necessarily a moment. It's kind of like turning the Titanic, you know, you got to go, er, 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 you know, until you're going in a different direction. And for, for me, what was that part of that pivotal moment was I went back to school. I got a master's degree. I started teaching at the university. I started a publishing house, started publishing books. And then the final part of that third part of that formula is what it's like now. Now I'm able to coach and guide everyday people 
to write high impact nonfiction books that really do change lives and mm -hmm. save lives and transform society. So that formula for telling your own story is really something worth thinking about yeah. because it was, it's just like what you just said. People want to know the, the backstory, but they also want to know where you are now to know that you're the authority that they can rely upon in order to get the services that they are seeking. That, that's that's wonderful. So when when you do this with people, do you do it? Um, I know some people like interview people and to get it this way. So a lot of us work better with interviews or yeah. do you have the actual doctors, right? I'm sure you have us. You can do it on your own or you can do it with you. Right. So probably. the well, I have, Yeah, it's kind of it's there's a couple of ways to do it. The first way that I work with people is one on one. And let me just say it. For, we're not ghostwriters. We're not writing your book. You're writing it. And I want to tell you why, because. Let's talk about ghostwriting for a minute. Ghostwriting is somebody who interviews you. They have set questions and they gather the information from the interview and then they write the book. Now you'll see many famous people use ghostwriters and it'll say by um, Laura Bush with somebody that with person wrote the book. OK, the problem with that is they can only go as deep as the questions are and they're not necessarily gathering the essence of the person and their knowledge because they haven't invested they'll spend a lot of time in the interviews but they still aren't digging where they're only digging where their questions lead them so in our process what we do is we and it's a step-by-step -step process we start off with this series of foundational questions that's really helps you to crystallize your message and it's things like, you know, why are you even doing this? You know, mm -hmm. what's your motivation? Who's your audience specifically? How's the audience going to be changed as a result of taking in your material? And there's 12 of these questions. What we end up doing is taking your answers to those and distilling them down into a purpose statement for the book that says, the purpose of this book is to do this particular thing for this specific audience, period. And then your job becomes to deliver the audience to the purpose of the book. Mm -hmm. So you can't put everything you know in one book. You have to target it to your audience and to that purpose. And so once we have that purpose statement, then we create um, a book map, which is a visual representation of everything that's going to be in your book. And the book map is constructed, your, we construct your chapters in problem solution sets. Good. What's the problem your audience is likely to have? And then back to your stories. Through a very story-driven methodology, you present your solutions. That's, uh, that, that's, that's awesome. That's and so to take it further, and this is all part of this, this process that's a you know proprietary process. When your book is finished, you have you can take that material and repurpose it across multiple venues, some of them even revenue producing. You can because you have they're each containers. A chapter is a container of information. Be a blog post, they could be a podcast, they can be a Exactly, exactly. Seminars, workshops, video training, yep. anything, because you have the material all there. That's, and so that's awesome. when people, we talk about your book as being a great, great foundation of, for your business so that you can concentrate on the problems that you, you like to treat. I mean, I think that I don't think everybody likes to do everything in podiatry. I mean, I saw that podiatry show about the that one that has these terrible problems with these gross feet. I couldn't stop. I mean, I couldn't watch any more of it because it was so hard to watch. But I don't think, I mean, I know doctors and other specialties, there's certain things they really like to do. So let's elevate those things so that you can attract patients to you for the specialties that you really excel in. I love that, Nancy, how you can, so repurposing your content, then as you, and I think even just the whole process of, we don't think enough or analyze enough why we do what we do and what we really like to do. So pick out two or three of those things that you really like, 
not not talking about what you don't like because what you talk about is what you attract. Now I'm going to I'm going to talk about the elephant in the room. I think our patients and people in general are very lazy and we don't read or very few okay people that I know very few reading books. They prefer TikTok, they prefer little short videos, they prefer you know all these other things. In this day and age, I'm sure there are other reasons to have a book. They might get your book, they might download your free PDF and not even read it, but there's a benefit to you having a book. Talk a little bit to that. Well, okay. Well, first I want to, you're bringing up a question that you didn't ask and that that's kind of like, it has to do with attention span. Okay. So how long should your book be? People always ask me, how long should my book be? And I have a standard answer and it's this, not one word longer than it needs to be because we have short attention spans and I need, I will teach you to write in a concise manner that is targeted and to the point. Nobody wants fluff and all that stuff. So your chapters can be short and concise and targeted and still accomplish your message. Now, you think that people aren't gonna wanna read a book, but when their feet are hurting and when they have neuropathy and their feet are burning or whatever, Don't read gonna anything. Do, well, they're gonna do anything to figure out how to get relief. And so often doctors will use their book as a, um, you know, they'll give it away to their patients, you know, and they'll, or prospective patients, or if they're trying to attract, um, you know, partners or even, you know, maybe referral partners in the industry, you know. Other oh, like primary care doctors or, yeah. or things yeah, like exactly. that. Exactly. Exactly. And so um, your book should do three things for you. It should establish you as an expert in your field. It should increase your credibility and it should help you attract a following, but it will only do those things if it's well written. And I want to talk a little bit about that because that is so key. And so people often give me their self-published books and they're really proud. Oh, look, I wrote a book. And it's amazing that they wrote a book. But when I open it, I often think, oh my gosh, don't give this to anybody else. I mean, it's like the font's huge because I tried to make it longer or that it wasn't edited and it's grammar errors and it's just not well done. And so we really, when we, our clients that we work for, we're like, okay, look, we're an award-winning publishing house. Your book is going to stand shoulder to shoulder with anything else out there on the market that's good. And um, you'll be published, you know, professionally published through by a publishing house. But it doesn't need to, you don't need to bulk it up and try to make it longer than it is. Just get to the point, establish your credibility by sharing something of yourself and telling stories and showing your expertise through the work that you present in your book. Awesome. That's awesome. Uh, and I, I think you, you, you alluded to some of the other ways of using your book, because uh, one thing is getting the, the book published. And just for those that are listening, it's more going to be, I think probably, I don't think we're going to be like an Amazon bestseller or a New York Times bestseller, but it's more for our circle of influence and in kind that's of using right. our book. Is that correct, Nancy? Yeah, most of the time, that's right. I mean, most because people, uh, you know, podiatrists are local, right? I mean, you don't care about someone in, you know, a state five states over you know coming to you because they usually won't you know so you want to penetrate your local audience and you know the other thing I want to talk about too is that the opportunities that your book can open for you as a professional are vast for example um, I mean you know there's a lot of podiatry conferences and they're always needing speakers and those who have books are the ones who are most preferred because it, it's you know, it's kind of like getting a college degree, you know, maybe, you know, you went through the process to do something and to do it well. And yeah. that's a, you know, it's an advantage over others who don't have that. It builds credibility, right? Yeah. That's part of what I said. It should help you to build your credibility. You know, as long as it's well done, you can trash your credibility in an instant. I mean, it's, you know, I, I, I think that's key because I, 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 you know, I'm as, as entrepreneurs, we're always looking for what's the next best thing, right? And so there's a couple of things that came out. One was called Designer with two R's. And basically it's, it's, a, it's, it's an app that you, 
you record it. It takes it can take an actual YouTube video, trans take the transcription, make it into a, a book, but it's not edited at all. You know, it's like free form. And I've seen some people's books, they're free form, they're talking transcribed into a book, and it just uh, it hurts to read. It hurts, yeah. Right. And yeah. uh, I, the other question, why physical book versus PDF? Tell me, explain to me why physical book versus PDF download. Well, let's go back to the credibility point you were making. A PDF is nothing, you know? I mean, seriously, my grandkids that I was telling you about earlier, my six-year-old can produce a PDF. They're doing that stuff in school now, you know? So it's nothing to attach a PDF. And, you know, usually that's like a report or, you know, it's just not... So, and sometimes people call things books that are yep. five page PDFs. You know, that's, that's, that's not a book. Well, it's not a book. It's they should be embarrassed to be using that word, you know, because it's like, it's like bait and switch kind of thing, you know, yeah. it's not honest is what I think I'm trying to say. Yeah. If you have a professionally published book. Again, the credibility piece is immeasurable. Yeah, that, that's good. And I'm going to, uh, if I can, before you, you send it, tell us any other final tips you have. Uh, a tip for if someone that wants to learn to be a writer, whether it be a blogger, book writer, things like that. I found there's a, it's, it's, it's Stephen Pressfield. He talks about resistance to, to creating content. And I think sometimes, you know, sitting down is, do you advocate like an hour every day or 30 minutes every day, just to kind of free flow writing, or do you recommend just to, a whole day to write or go somewhere else? How do you, what, what's the best you know, habits? Like, that people... That's a great question. It's really pretty individual. Um, I know another podiatrist, Dr. Peter Wishney, yep. mm -hmm. who, who advocates for these, um, having a day for doing non-practice stuff. And he's done a couple of books with me. And so he's done, you know, he uses that day to write. Uh, part of what we do when I'm working with clients is, remember I told you about that book map. So you're going to have everything that you're going to put in your book on that map. So you know what that means? That means no writer's block ever. Writer's block is you're just sitting there thinking. That's great. You know what you're going to do. You know what you're going to do. And so um, um, we, we, can, we really guide our clients to do some time blocking on their calendar okay. to block off time. Good. And what a lot of people have found is if they do it in an hour a day, that gets them into the rhythm. But then sometimes they'll switch later and think, well, I just got into my material and then my hour was up, you know? So they'll think, okay, I need two hours on an afternoon or something like that. But um, yeah. all you're doing is writing the things that are down on your book map. And so then we, polish it all up in another module where we edit it and then of course the final thing that stands between you writing your book and us publishing it is us doing a professional edit of your book so that it's market ready okay getting rid of all my passive voice that i'm really good at oh i can't believe you just said that that is exactly what we do i know it's i well it's because i was so uh, history i was a history major yeah. And the reason I chose history is because I, I, I wasn't very good at writing and I wanted to learn to write better. And, oh. that, and that's why I did history. And then you went into funny. medicine. And then I went into medicine and it was my backup gig. If I didn't and get you got a backstory there. Yeah, I would have gone into that. Actually, I wanted to be a magician even before that. But anyway, <laughs> that's a different story. But thank you, Nancy. I think we've learned a, a, a lot. Um, any tips? Like, do you recommend, I think it's called glam Grammarly. Do you recommend anything? Yeah, Grammarly is really good because it does help you with your grammar and gives you word suggestions and, and things like that. So I have Grammarly installed on my computer. Um, and I'm always irritated when it flags something because I think, oh, I should have known better. <laughs> uh, but Grammarly is great. And there's a free version of it that people yep, There is, there is. But you said one of the most important things is learning to use active language. So um, I don't know. It's, it's um, you know, the more you write, the better you get. I think that's true. And if people want to learn more, Nancy, do you have any uh, free downloads, courses, anything like that? How can they learn more about you? Well, I have a book. I have a website. It's thebookprofessor.com. And um, if you're interested in kind of exploring something about writing your own book, I'd love to chat with you. You can just email me at nancy at thebookprofessor.com. Great. Well, this is very fun. Thank you so much. Pleasure meeting you. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much.